Okay, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, I'm Sarah Carr, I'm coordinator of the EBM Tools Network. Um, and I am standing in from Lauren Wenzel uh, from the NOAA National MPA Center. Um, Lauren is unfortunately unable to be here today. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge all the co-hosts of this webinar. Uh, this is co hosted by the NOAA's National MPA Center, uh, and they are the coordinators, but it, uh, we, they also work with my organization, the EBM Tools Network, and Open Channels for putting this webinar on. And we also have Nick Weiner from Open Channels, who is here with us today, helping to uh, uh, coordinate and moderate when needed. Um, so our speaker today is Alan Leonardi. Um, Alan is director of the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. He leads a team responsible for providing direction to NOAA and the U.S. Department of Commerce in the field of ocean exploration, research, and advanced technology development. Uh, Alan is an XPRIZE advisory board member for the Shell Ocean Discovery XPRIZE, which is a three-year global competition that challenges researchers to build better technologies for mapping Earth's seafloor. Alan is a meteorologist and an oceanographer, and he's been with NOAA since 2003. Some of his previous roles include uh, being coordinator for NOAA's environmental modeling program um, for NOAA's Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, uh, serving as Deputy Director of Policy Planning and Evaluation um, within the OAR headquarters, and serving as Deputy Director of NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory. Uh, Alan earned his undergraduate degree in meteorology from the University of Wisconsin and his master's and doctorate degrees in physical oceanography from Florida State. Um, he was awarded the Department of Commerce Silver Medal for his leadership efforts fostering a partnership with Google on the development and deployment of NOAA data and information in Google's Google Earth platform. Okay, so great. Um, I just Before we get started, and I turn this over to Alan. I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. So we'll have about 30 to 40 minutes of present minutes of presentation, and at the end of that we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, you can send in questions for me to relay to Alan um, by uh, typing them into the question panel of your user interface. Um, and you can send them in at any point. Um, if there's any quick clarifying questions, we might ask them uh, during the presentation, but we'll save all the substantive ones for later in the presentation uh, for the Q&A session. Um, and also, if you just have any questions for the moderators, you can send them in that same way. OK, uh, it's over to you now, Alan. All right, well, thank you, Sarah. And, and thanks also to the MPA uh, Center and the sponsors for uh, inviting me to take a few minutes of time to talk about ocean exploration, in particular, its relationship to uh, to MPAs. Um, if I'm going to, I'm just going to jump right in and give you a little bit of an overview of what I plan to discuss. First, I'll, I'll start out by giving a little brief overview of why we explore, why that's part of this mission. Then a, a, a little brief snippets on how we do that, the science and the technology that we use, and of course the broad community of, of explorers that we work with and partner with, uh, and who also bring a lot of their own resources and technology to the table. Uh, and then I'm going to jump into uh, how ocean exploration and, and MPAs are intertwined, at least at the moment, right? Focusing in on some of the data and information side of things, and then how that data and information um, can be or has been used for establishing MPAs by the MPA community, how it could be used to expand or propose for MPAs, and then also how it could be used to look at cultural and historical features. And then I'm going to close by talking about a little bit of future activities that are planned by, by this office. Uh, but I want to start with one really big caveat. And that ca caveat here is that we're using MPA as a kind of a general catch-all term for any marine area with some level of protection. So you can think about this from marine protected areas to sanctuaries to monuments and things of that nature. And, and focusing specifically from a NOAA perspective on those that we have management responsibilities for. So let's jump right in and first touch on why we explore. Uh, the first main point that I'd like to make is that most of the ocean is unexplored, quite frankly. Um, there are estimates about how much has been explored, how much hasn't been explored. It kind of depends on your definition of what that means. Uh, but, but to put it very simply, the majority of the ocean floor, the benthic areas of the ocean, have not been seen by the human eye, whether that's directly or whether that's through some proxy using cameras and robots and things of that nature. So that's a, that's a pretty good motivation for doing it. It's, it's nice to know kind of what, what's down there. 
but also importantly is the fact that the deep ocean is pretty important for the human population. It, of course, could hold and does hold energy resources. It, it could have an impact on food resources. Uh, and as science has shown, it could prove to have cures for diseases. There's some research that, that's been used on particularly sponges that are now going to clinical uh, trial stages to focus on um, looking at treating certain types of, of uh, cancers or Alzheimer's. It's also, of course, pretty critical to put information in the hands of decision makers. As I said, NOAA has management responsibilities for large swaths of the ocean, these protected areas, monuments, and sanctuaries. And it, it's pretty difficult to manage what we don't know. So part of our role in exploration is to help provide some initial baseline characterization so that these communities of decision makers know what is there so that they can figure out what that means in terms of science and management uh, and use that as a launching off point for their decision making. Um, the other thing that, that's important to point out for exploration and, and what we do, which I'll touch upon in the next few slides and how we do it, is that extreme conditions in the deep ocean mean it's often very difficult to operate here or we lack the tools and the technologies to get to these places. The tools that I'll talk about in a few slides are some of the things that we can bring to the table uh, to help get into these areas, to provide baseline characterization, to explore them and to deliver data to those communities that need it. Of course. Our planet is also not static, so we, we collect this baseline knowledge that's needed to deliver science and inform decisions, but we also know that that means that there needs to be some repeat data that has to go, be gone back to. Whether that's done by us or whether that's done by resource managers or the science community um, doesn't really matter, but we have to at some point get initial data and baseline characterizations, and that's one of the primary focus points for this office. Uh, and then the other point um, I'd like to make is that the Office of Ocean Exploration Research is, uh, is the only federal organization currently dedicated to exploring our unknown ocean. There aren't a lot of groups doing this. There are, and we work very closely with, with as many of them as we possibly can, um, but there's not a lot that are doing it, and this office is the only federal organization dedicated to exploring the ocean. Uh, we do it, of course, to enhance research and policy and management decisions, to develop new lines of scientific inquiry, and to advise NOAA and the nation on critical issues that, that we may not be thinking about um, fully. So now that we've talked about some of the reasons why we would explore, why don't we jump right into um, some of the science and technology that we use. Of course, the picture here is of the NOAA vessel Okeanos Explorer. It is the only federal vessel dedicated to the mission of ocean exploration. It is only used for ocean exploration purposes. Uh, and we typically spend probably about somewhere between 175 to 195 days at sea uh, exploring the oceans. We, we also use submersible platforms. There was an image on an earlier slide of our deep diving ROV that's capable of of diving up to 6,000 meters deep, or 3.7 miles. Uh, it's a dual-bodied system that has cameras on it, it has uh, other sensors on it, and of course it has the capability of collecting samples. Uh, we also use a technique called telepresence, which was pioneered by the, by the exploration community in terms of science use. Uh, that is a, is a capability where basically um, we use satellite systems on board the ship to allow anybody with an internet connection to watch or participate in our expeditions in real time via live streaming, live video and data streaming. So a, a lot of you probably have, may have participated over the years or, or paid attention to some of our expeditions or our partner expeditions. Uh, this is one of those tools that allows us to do that. But it also allows us to engage members of the scientific community in a much broader way. Ships, as we know, have limited berthing space. They have limited deck space. Having the telepresence steaming, uh, streaming and allowing uh, the science community to participate in interactively in the process uh, really improves the science that we're able to conduct on these missions for the benefit of the entire community. Um, we, of course, have sampling plans and protocols that are in place to support this. Uh, our manipulator arms on, our, on our, our deep diving ROV are capable of collecting biological and geological samples. And when we bring those to the deck, we, we need to have sampling plans and protocols in place uh, to make sure that they're properly preserved. Uh, and then our goal with all of our data is, is always to get it out to the community as fast as possible. And that includes our samples. Our samples are brought to the deck. They're, they're, there's some level of curation that happens on the deck. But then they're, they're archived at national repositories uh, that are and made available to the scientific community for study and analysis. Our goal is to get the data into the hands of the community of scientists who would use that data for whatever their scientific purposes. Um, 
of course, when you collect more than just samples, you have multi-beam bathy data, you have you know temperature and salinity data and things like that, you also need to have data management systems and tools in place. And so one of the things that we do is we spend quite a bit of time partnering with um, another part of NOAA, the, the uh, National Centers for Environmental Information, to make sure that the data that we collect, uh, which is anything from oceanographic and geophysical parameters, video, images, documents, and other information, uh, are provided in a, in, a, in a variety of formats and del deliberately distributed out to centers and archives for, for um, public and community consumption. Um, our goal is typically to get that done in about a 60-day window once the completion of a cruise takes place. Uh, and after that, the community can use it for whatever they want. And then the last point I want to make here is that, of course, you can't do anything, any of this, without focusing a little bit of time and effort on technology advancement. Now, from a budgetary perspective, this could be a pretty expensive proposition, but we partner with people uh, in other government agencies, we partner with philanthropic organizations, we partner with nonprofit organizations, of course, academia and the private sector, to look at how to advance uh, the technology and, and that's used to expand the, the pace, the scope, and the efficiency of exploration. We've played an important role in funding exploration and technology development for various MPAs and MPA programs, uh, and to date, the, the exploration community has made some pretty major advancements with underwater vehicles, high definition imagery, which is both acoustic and optical in nature, and defining how to integrate all of these new sensors and new platforms uh, into data streams that are available and usable for those who need it. Of course, we're always looking for, for new and novel ways to, to contribute to these technological advancements. Uh, for example, we've partnered with the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries to explore the applicability of using larger AUVs for habitat mapping and maritime heritage investigations. An example here would be the use of, of the large AUV Echo Ranger, which is a Boeing product to, to map the U.S. In, S. independence, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and of, but you know, when you look at all of these technologies, you look at the reasons why we explore, you, you, of course, you can't do it in isolation. It really is a broad community of people who participate in these expeditions, whether on the ship or whether in remote locations, as you see in these pictures here. Uh, it could be at a desktop in somebody's office, or it could be at, at a place that we call uh, exploration command centers, either formal or informal ones, like on the lower so slide, which is at the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute at Florida Atlantic University. Um, during an expedition, we plan and we consult with the scientific community to both set scientific priorities, but also to identify specific mapping and dive targets that the, that the community believes has the highest level of promise for either discovery or advancing scientific knowledge. Um, we, we can't do that in the absence of partnerships. Uh, they're necessary to, to, to find those and set those priorities, but they're also necessary to raise the public profile of ocean exploration and citizen science uh, and making sure that we're delivering data to all the communities who need it. Uh, many of the partners that we work very closely with are other NOAA offices, some of which I've mentioned already. Uh, the Ocean Exploration Trust, which is run by Bob Ballard, the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration run by Dave Lavalvo, and the Schmidt Ocean Institute, uh, which is run by Eric and Wendy Schmidt, and they operate the, their vessel Falcor. OET operates the vessel uh, Nautilus. We, we work with them as well. And they work with the scientific communities to set these exploration priorities and to share our data. The, the other main thing here from a community perspective is our goal is to open source our data. We want the data to make, be publicly available to anybody who wants it, typically within 60 days of our expeditions. We've turned around data as fast as eight days and made them publicly available in national repositories. But no matter what, we're typically trying to hit the 60-day window, and getting our data out there so the science community can jump on it and start looking at it for discoveries and scientific information. That open access data provides a real platform for open innovation uh, and idea generation uh, and further on scientific studies. Now, I, I've already noted that the community in, involves partnering to discuss with the scientific community what the priorities should be, working with our partners what the priorities should be. But we also not only, we don't just conduct exploration ourselves, we also support exploration through federal funding opportunities to many outfits, uh, including I've already talked about the Ocean Exploration Trust. We fund scientists to participate on the Schmidt Ocean Institute's vessel. They're, they're providing the ship time. We provide uh, science support time. 
We use a, a, a federal funding opportunity grant and proposal process to fund exploration projects for research partners, primarily in academic institutions, but oftentimes in partnership with philanthropic organizations and private organizations as well. Uh, and of course, some of the some of the projects that we've funded um, are have led to major discoveries, but all of them support our goal to acquire baseline characterizations of unknown or poorly known areas of the ocean and to get that data and information out to the community as fast as possible. We are also charged through um, federal language with uh, han handling what are called National Ocean Exploration Forms. Several of these have taken place uh, to date, and these are forms that are that are by our office uh, with our partners to promote collaboration amongst the many partners in the exploration community and to enhance the expertise and the relevance of the national exploration efforts. Uh, we, we do this in an inclusive, uh, inclusive way. We are, are focusing these days on strategic multi-year campaigns when we do this. Uh, and what we're trying to do is foster a collaborative network of ocean explorers that are trying to address the most critical needs and information desired by the community as a whole, whether it's exploration or whether it's science needs. We, we also, I, I would be remiss if I didn't focus also on the fact that we spend quite a bit of time on education and outreach. Um, it plays a critical role in all we do, not the least of which is if we plan to have ocean scientists and ocean explorers and ocean engineers in the future, we better be hooking them as young as we possibly can. So some of the things that we do in this office is to develop lesson plans that are designed to be used hand in hand with our with our expeditions while they're going on. And we, we provide those lesson plans on the on the on our website. There's a, a somewhere on the order of five hundred of them now. Uh, and we share them with anybody who wants them, whether they're the teachers or educators or e even uh, informal educators. Uh, and we conduct professional development training opportunities for those communities at no cost to the educators. Uh, in fact we actually give them a modest stipend to attend. Um, so that they understand what materials are available and how they might be able to use them and link them to the to their scientific activities within their classrooms. So we and we of course we don't do this in in a vacuum without our partners as well. Uh, and we and we like to use um, live media events. We like to use a number of channels, including websites, social media, print materials, uh, exploration command centers, ship tours, and things of that nature, to also educate the general members of the public, not just the academic community as well. So a, a little here that we've touched upon about why we do what we do, uh, how we do it in terms of a technology perspective, but also how we do it in terms of the community of people that are involved in making this all happen. I, I hope that this set the stage a little bit for jumping into the interface between exploration and MPAs. Um, first, I, I would be really, it would be ill-advised for me not to focus on the, the importance of getting input from the MPA community. While we, we seek input from all science members of the community, the work that we do that directly ties to MPAs really requires input from the MPA programs to identify future target areas for exploration. Uh, and these can be identified anything through our federal funding opportunities, our workshops, partnerships, scientific meeting discussions, and things of that nature. Um, and then we use that information then to jump in and explore in and around these MPA areas to better understand their habitats and the communities uh, and, and to give that data and information to the MPA communities. Uh, we have the technological capabilities to reach some of the depths that some MPAs cannot. So our goal is to help them get that additional information where they may not be able to and transfer the info and the data from our cruises and expeditions directly to those MPA programs, uh, either through onboard personnel, if they're participating in the, in the mission directly, uh, through the command centers, or at least no later than you know, typically 60 days post-cruise when we're delivering the data out to the community and in many cases directly to the MPA's uh, managers themselves. Of course, all of the data and information that we collect through ocean exploration can be used to support MPAs in a number of ways. I'll discuss those a little bit in the coming slides with some examples. Um, but we, we can't do it without the participation of those in the MPA communities helping guide us and vector us into exploring those areas that are of most importance to the MPA community. So I, I leave a little bit of a provocative question here for asking you how you can participate. 
There's a number of ways, of course, you can participate directly, helping us identify targets and science priorities and things of that nature. Many in the MPA community are already doing that. Um, but you can also participate live in real time. As I've said, the telepresence technology allows individuals to participate either from their desktop uh, or their kitchen table, if they'd rather, uh, or even from your mobile phone. We have a mobile phone that will allow you to stream live what's happening uh, when we're in the water. But you can also participate at some of our exploration command centers if you choose to have a, a much stronger interface and interaction with those communities who are working directly with the ship. Uh, those, there's a variety of those locations around the country that you can access. If anybody's interested, you just need to let us know. Uh, but we've got locations at Stennis Space Center in Mississippi, Florida Atlantic University. Uh, we've got a location in Seattle at, at NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Lab, one in Newport, Oregon at an outpost of that same laboratory. We've got one in the NOAA buildings in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, the Interspace Center, which is a critical hub for what we do. Uh, they're the primary data transmission mechanism for all of this exists at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, there's one that's been set up at the Inouye Regional Center in Honolulu, one at the University of Hawaii in Manoa, uh, and currently there's some activities going on in and around uh, Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. So we've set up some, some not official ECCs, but some viewing areas at the University of Guam and also at the uh, Underwater World Guam, the Waikiki Aquarium, and the Maui Ocean Center. Uh, are also streaming live feeds. So those are ways that, that could potentially be, be uh, participating in these activities. Oops, sorry, I jumped too far here. Um, so, so what do we do with the data and the information? How, how, do we, how do we and our partners conduct these interdisciplinary baseline characterizations uh, and then make that information accessible to MPA programs and managers? And, and here to describe this, I kind of want to just go through a couple of examples of some of the things that we do. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll go through these piece by piece, and starting with the, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, since 2004, OER and its federal partners have, have spent quite a bit of time characterizing poorly known ecosystems in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. The top left image here is focusing on the tar lily that was discovered uh, when we were out exploring in the Gulf of Mexico. Ironically, we were looking for a shipwreck. Uh, everybody thought this was the target for the shipwreck. When we got down to the target, we realized it wasn't a shipwreck, but but actually a, nat a natural asphalt extrusion. Um, and, and so many would think that that would, that would be difficult for an expedition. You're like, oh, great. You, know, you have all these marine archaeologists participating in, in the, the expedition from shore or on the ship. And you would think, oh, great, expedition's a bust. Well, the beautiful thing about using telepresence and streaming live and engaging people from command centers is that we were able to turn that community around and bring in the people who are excited about the asphalt extrusion within about 30 to 45 minutes. So you're out there doing great work, and just because you find something that wasn't unexpected doesn't mean that the expedition's a bust. It actually means, because of the way that we operate, that you might have better opportunity to ensure that the science communities that need to be paying attention and participating in real time can. So here's an example of, of some work that we were doing um, in this area. The work in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic, of course, also provides the necessary science for the responsible exploration and management of energy resources, including knowing where ecologically important habitats and hotspots are for fish uh, and, and areas that, that we may want to avoid. Um, from uh, an exploitation perspective. Uh, the second example I want to focus on is Pulley Ridge and its connective connectivity to the MPA community. Uh, beginning in 2011, uh, OER supported partner, uh, the Cooperative Institute for Ocean Exploration Research and Technology, which is located at Florida Atlantic University Harbor Branch Oceanographic, uh, began participating in a multi-year investigation funded in part by OER, but also in part by uh, NOAA's National uh, centers for Coastal Ocean Science, and, and the, the, what they're looking for here is a multi-year investigation into how species associated with the deep coral reefs around the marine protected area, Pulley Ridge, habitat area of particular concern, may replenish fish, key fish species and other organisms in the downstream reefs of the Florida Keys, National Marine Sanctuary, and Tortugas Ecological Preserve. Great science has come out of this. Uh, hopefully, there, hopefully, at some point, there'll be some follow-on expansion activities that are going on with that, uh, one of which I'll touch upon towards the end uh, that, that focuses on Cuba. Um, but then the other major one that I want to talk about is our, is our campaign to address the Pacific Monument Science, Technology, and Ocean Needs, uh, known as the Capstone Campaign. It's a, it's a major multi-year foundational science effort 
focused on the deep water areas of the U.S. Marine protected areas in the Central and the Western Pacific. And again, here I say protected areas, I mean MPAs, sanctuaries, monuments, and things of that nature that, that NOAA has management responsibility for, uh, sometimes in conjunction with other federal agencies. Um, the investment here is intended to provide timely and actionable information to support the decision making based uh, to, su to support the decision making um, by providing re reliable and author authoritative data to support the science needs of these communities. Uh, it also, of course, serves as an opportunity for the nation to highlight the uniqueness and importance of these national symbols of ocean conservation. Uh, and, as a, and as an example of how you might be able to participate, I'll just say that from, from April 20th till July 10th, uh, the NOAA vessel Oceanus Explorer will be investigating and documenting deep water environments in and around the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands and the Marianas Trench Marine National Monument. Uh, we'll be heading back to, to Honolulu uh, later this year, and we're going to be doing some more work in the Pacific uh, in, the F, in the calendar year 17 as well, including uh, the Phoenix Islands protected area. Um, and then hopefully in the future we'll, we'll have some work funded by others that's going to follow this up, and I, I can touch upon that uh, in a little bit, of, in a little while. So the, with these as a few examples, I guess the real question is, is then how has that data and information been used uh, by the MPA community? And, and one of the ways that it's been used is in the establishment of, uh, of MPAs. Um, here I give a couple of examples. There are, there are others that I can touch upon as well. Uh, one prominent example is the, the Atlantic Canyons, uh, which over a period of, of, of three to four years, um, our office initiated a, a major cross-NOAA effort uh, and cross-agency effort to map and ground truth the Atlantic Canyons off the northeastern United States. Uh, in, in 2005, some of the data, the data and information from this effort uh, has been used by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council um, to, to take a look at those deep canyons, to take, take a look at the, the characterization, and, and to approve a deep seas coral amendment that is aimed at protecting fragile areas from damaging bottom tending gear, or potentially damaging bottom, bottom tending gear, and, and included, includes designating several of these areas as habitat areas of particular concern. Another example is uh, in the 2011 time frame, uh, OER took the opportunity to conduct a uh, major mapping effort in the vicinity of Southern California at the request of MPA uh, personnel um, and, and other NOAA offices, uh, such as the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, to focus on and map the areas within uh, both Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary to, to uh, characterize several areas, uh, including areas designated to protect rockfish uh, such as the cow cod conservation area. Here we focused on exploring not just the general area and, and characterizing those benthic habitats such as deep sea corals and sponges and, and their associated biota, but, but specifically we, we focused on areas where the use of scuba to assess the importance of these deep sea corals and sponge fields to rockfish uh, might have been uh, too deep or limited by depth or time. So employing a remotely operated vehicle such such as uh, our office uses and, and our, our partners use, uh, it, can, it can overcome some of those limitations along the way. And, and it's important also to note that some of the data and information also, <coughs> excuse me, in, um, influence the, the overall international uh, MPA community as well. This last example of the Kermadec Ocean Sanctuary, it, <coughs> it's an area that was, has been proposed in 2016 by New Zealand uh, for protection and it's, it's, it's focused on a lot of the data and, and the exploration that was conducted in the region by this office or supported by this office um, to provide the baseline geological, hydrothermal, and biological information about the areas. And, and they're using that data and information then to propose the establishment of a sanctuary in these areas. So a couple of examples of places where um, the data has been used to form protected areas. Um, other examples exist as well, but these, these are kind of representative of those things that, that exist. But the data can also not just be used to establish uh, or set the, the, the groundwork for establishment of an MPA. They can also be used to look at whether an MPA might need to be expanded. So these three examples are areas in which OER 
has either supported or conducted work um, in in areas that ended up with expansion or proposals for expansion. Uh, the 2010 to 11 timeframe, OER funded a team of marine archaeologists at Thunder Bay Marine Sanctuary uh, to operate a sonar mounted on a a sonar system mounted on a free swimming autonomous uh, underwater vehicle or AUV to survey the lake bottom in and around the sanctuary. Um, the data that was collected from that along with a lot of political and public support uh, was used for a proposed expansion of the sanctuary boundary and, and eventually uh, actual expansion from its original 448 uh, square miles to 4,300 square miles. That, that expansion took place in, in 2014 and added some significant protection to a number of newly documented shipwrecks and other items important to the maritime history of the region. Uh, additional work has been done with Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, this one goes back a bit to 2002 where OER in collaboration with the sanctuary and partnering with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute uh, explored the Davidson Seamount uh, with the goal of finding out what was there, what the habitats looked like, uh, video and data from those expeditions showed that the seamount held some pretty unique animals and habitats, uh, and it was determined that they deserved protection, or at least to be proposed for protection. Uh, in 2009, that data and information uh, was some of the data that was used uh, for the sanctuary expansion to include that seamount, the Davidson Seamount. And then, of course, the, the last example here is focused on the proposed expansion of the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, which in January 2016, NOAA released a, an expansion proposal for this area. Um, prior to that proposal, OER was asked to map in an area in the vicinity of the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary that hadn't yet been mapped, uh, and that, that expedition found a U-boat that they've been looking for for quite some time. Uh, that, that baseline characterization data and information then contributed to the justification for the sanctuary's proposed expansion. Uh, and the funding, of course, helped the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries expand the theme of this sanctuary by encompassing other historical events and, and significant shipwrecks of the area. So uh, here's a couple of examples of where areas have either been expanded or proposed for expansion. Uh, three more not listed here include a proposed expansion of the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, uh, the expansion of the Gulf of Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, and the expansion of Cordell Bank uh, National Marine Sanctuary as well. So, you can see here that the exploration activities can provide some pretty detailed information and maps of the cultural, historical, and the archaeological sites um, used to both establish and potentially expand these areas, but, but also used to identify some of the cultural and historical features that are in these areas. Uh, a couple of examples here of this work, again, representative, there's, there's plenty others as well. Uh, is where we've worked with the science community to discover and characterize these vast and largely unknown repositories of submerged cultural resources. Um, the first example is, is the lost Arctic whaling fleet in the Western Arctic, uh, where in, uh, in 2015 uh, OER provided some technical and financial assistance uh, and worked with sanctuary scientists used, who used advanced side scan sonar and mapping capabilities to explore and map the area thought to be where these lost whaling fleets uh, were, this is a, a circa 1871 uh, issue, uh, the, the Sanctuaries Act as amended of 2000 then directs the Secretary of Commerce to support and promote and coordinate research on, on these things and on the conservation, curation, and public display of the cultural, archaeological, and historical resources of National Marine Sanctuaries. So this is an example where recent work uh, with sanctuary scientists um, looked at these Arctic whaling fleets. Uh, another example in March of 2015, um, NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, uh, with some, some support um, from the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, worked with Boeing to, uh, to conduct an expedition to survey uh, the wreck of the World War II aircraft carrier USS Independence as part of a mission to locate and do document historic shipwrecks in the Gulf of Farallons National Marine Sanctuary and nearby waters. Uh, the bathymetric data and the maps, which you can see in the, in the center picture here, um, acquired in, in by the office in 2009 were used to inform this as well. And then the team used Boeing's large state-of-the-art AUV equipped with an advanced Coda Octopus three-dimensional mapping sonar to fly over the wreck to map it in detail. Um, sanctuaries, uh, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, of course, is legally required to map and understand these areas. Uh, and this is an example of where OER was able to help support and bring together the exploration and the marine technology communities, in this case a private sector entity, Boeing, 
to, to do something that NOAA has a management responsibility for. Uh, and also, quite frankly, just to put it plainly, is pretty darn cool science. Um, so pretty exciting stuff. And then the last example I want to I want to focus on is a is a 2010 example where OER used synthetic aperture sonar uh, to survey and locate archaeological resources in the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, this technology, the synthetic aperture sonar technology, really exemplifies recent advances in geophysical survey technology. Uh, and, and we're expecting that they're going to revolutionize seafloor mapping because they provide very, very high resolution uh, maps of the seafloor. The project survey platform was the research vessel uh, SRVX, which is operated by the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And, and the team focused on re-imaging a previously located wreck of the steamship Portland um, that had collided with the remains of coal schooners um, Frank A. Palmer and Luis B. Crary. The, the synthetic aperture sonar was able to allow the scientists to have a better revelation of new aspects of both wreck sites uh, and, um, and, excuse me, a better representation of the two wreck sites, excuse me, the, the steamship Portland wreck site and the collision wreck site with the Palmer and the Crary. Um, and in addition to locating those historic shipwrecks, uh, the project seafloor maps are also informing the sanctuary's efforts, efforts to assess derelict fishing gear concentration. So here, here's just a couple of examples that we've talked about how the MPA, uh, MPAs and the MPA programs have benefited from ocean exploration and, and also how ocean exploration has benefited from working with these major partners to not only help advance the amount of data and information that's being collected, but also uh, improve the utility of that data and information for management decisions. Yet, there's a lot to come in the future. So with a quick look ahead here, uh, as I close out the conversation, I want to talk about a few of the things that we've got going on, some of which I've touched upon briefly already. Uh, first, um, there's some exploration going on in the Arctic. Of course, we are all aware that increasing human activity uh, in the Arctic um, is happening, climate change is happening, and as a result, we, we think it's pretty essential that we explore and, and understand the delicate ecosystems so that no one knows how best to manage it or understand at least the science around it. So in March of this year, uh, OER supported the first ever deep water exploration of Glacier Bay National Park. Uh, in the expedition, researchers collected critical data that is intended to help understand the essential fish habitats and how climate variability and change have been impacting or may be impacting those marine environments and, and when coral first began to occur in the region, because there are deep corals. Uh, some of the really interesting things that, that came out of this is that large, large, very large coral communities were discovered to exist in the park in areas where, they, where we previously did not know that they existed. Um, another Arctic-focused activity is that later this summer we will be supporting a 40-day expedition to, in the Arctic on the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Healy. This is a project that, that is uh, funded through a federal funding opportunity announcement that's going to be led by the University of Alaska Fairbanks and includes three integrated projects looking at seafloor, pelagic, and microbial communities. Uh, the project's going to use a combination of photographic mapping from remotely operated vehicles, physical sampling, and state-of-the-art metagenomics to assess the diversity of this region uh, from the levels of microbes to mammals and from the sea ice to the seafloor in what is really a poorly known bathymetrically and hydrographically complex region. We, as I also touched upon, are in the midst of our three-year capstone campaign and our 2017 field activities will be shifting back from the Western Pacific where we are this year uh, to the Central Pacific and likely include areas extending from the vicinity of the Hawaiian Archipelago south to the equator. Priority areas in consideration right now include the Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll, Jarvis Island, Howland and Baker Islands, and the Johnston Atoll portions of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. Uh, the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa it could be included, the Rose Atoll Marine National Monument, and additional work in the Phoenix Islands Protected Area and Musician Seamounts uh, could take place as well. So more to come on that. Stay tuned. And if you're interested, please reach out uh, and get a hold of us and see if there's a way for you to participate tangibly. Uh, we're also focusing beyond 2017 at a Mid-South Atlantic campaign um, that is kind of an extension of the previous work that we've done in, from the Northeast to the Mid-Atlantic. Um, mid -Atlantic. And we, we will have our kind of our first team of federal and non-federal partners initiate a field effort this fall um, to inform emerging science and management priorities off the mid and southeastern US. 
uh, and, it, and it's expected that the campaign will have direct consequences for, for not only guiding the wise use of living marine and energy resources and defining the connectivity of vulnerable ecological communities, but also the potential for understanding a tsunami prediction and hazards for coastal risks in the region. Um, we're hoping to be able to continue a major uh, multi-year, multi-agency, multi-partner effort in, in, this, in this regard. Um, but uh, this is all, of course, pending out your budgets. But we do expect approximately 10 expeditions will, will take place and gather the foundational information needed to support high priority science and management needs in the region. We also have a keen eye on the West Coast. Some of this is happening right now, uh, this coming year and next year, where OER is funding a significant amount of time with the uh, Ocean Exploration Trust. And, and a lot of that work is targeting national marine sanctuaries. Of course, I, I would be remiss if I didn't also note that the Trust is bringing their own resources to the table as well uh, for this, these expeditions. So they, they're, they're doing a lot of competitive matching of funds. So NOAA is able to leverage their capabilities and, and bring those capabilities to um, the sanctuaries. The staff, the sanctuary staff are leading several of those cruises. Uh, and Sanctuaries has also contributed a number of additional MTA-related targets for cruises that they are not necessarily leading or even participating in. So significant collaboration here across OER, the Ocean Exploration Trust, and the National Marine Sanctuaries to ensure the Exploration Trust work supports NOAA MTA-related priorities. And then I, of course, mentioned that, that we're looking at partnering on Cuba-related activities. So later this year, uh, the OER-funded Cooperative Institute for Ocean Exploration Research and Technology located at Harbor Branch Oceanographic is going to be doing an expedition to Cuba. And there's interest here in planning future expeditions and to potentially use MPAs as a platform for dialogue and cooperation in support of the, US, the new US partnership with Cuba. Of course, we also benefit by learning more about the MPAs, uh, the, the habitats that are there that need to be managed, and the science that supports that. So um, before I, I close and, and open up for questions, I'd like to take a brief moment to again thank the MPA Center uh, and all participating for inviting me to give a little bit of an overview of how ocean exploration and, and MPAs and protected areas are, are linked, but also to thank a number of people who have really supported uh, the development of the presentation and informed it over, over the years. Of course, my team here in the office uh, helped with the presentation and, of course, conduct a lot of the work. But also, I'd like to call out uh, Dr. Robert Brock, who's a marine, art bio marine biologist with NOAA's MPA Center, for helping to characterize and identify some of these interfaces between OER's exploration activities and the activities of the marine protected areas. So with that, I, I'm happy to close with and, and ask for some questions for those who may have them. OK, great. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, I wanted to repeat uh, to everyone how to ask questions. You can you send them in through the question panel and use your interface. Um, so, yeah, we have a couple questions, so let's get started. Um, somebody said, I can't recall, does the RV Nautilus focus on the East Coast while you focus on West Coast with Okeanos? No, no and, I, and I imagine, I imagine um, Bob Ballard is, is on the line or members of his team. Right now, the, the Okeanos Explorer is centered in Hawaii but operating in the Central and the Western Pacific. The exploration vessel Nautilus run by the Ocean Exploration Trust uh, recently moved over to the west coast of the U.S. and is focusing on exploring the areas along the west coast of the U.S. anywhere from from uh, from British Columbia down to uh, Mexico and even uh, the Galapagos, where an expedition took place last year. And that is focused over the next two-year period of time. Will be focusing on the west coast of the U.S. before they are 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 looking at transiting into the Central Pacific and consider con and and doing a lot of work in and around Hawaii and in the Western Pacific as well. That's going to happen at the point in time where the Okeanos Explorer transitions back to uh, towards the Atlantic Ocean at the end of calendar year 17. Um, but but that doesn't mean that we're ignoring the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic. Our federal funding opportunity notice for this past year, which was going through proposal review process right now, uh, focuses on trying to fund activities in the Gulf, the Caribbean, and the Atlantic Ocean. So we've got work going on in all basins by different partners. Um, and we're funding work by those who are proposing it um, in, in areas where the exploration vessel Nautilus or the NOAA vessel Okeanos Explorer, or as it turns out, the Schmidt Ocean Institute vessel Felcor, those are all three of those vessels are currently operating in the Pacific. 
Okay, um, and I just wanted to, uh, from Steve Giddings, he said, thank you, Alan, for highlighting the work that OER has done in support of National Marine Sanctuaries through exploration and telepresence. I don't know where we would be without the partnership with your program. You have an exceptional program built with highly capable people. Not a question, just a fact. Um, okay, so let me, let me, if, I may, if I may respond, I'd like to say thank you, Steve, but quite frankly, without groups like sanctuaries and MPAs and monuments, um, you could question whether or not we should exist. So we need partners such as the Sanctuary Program and the MPA Center uh, and, and the Monument Programs to make sure that the work that we're doing supports NOAA's mission. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, question, um, in today's world of shrinking budgets, how do you prioritize amongst what must be a very long list of places to explore? That, that's an excellent question and, of course, a very difficult one, as, as we all know. I, I think most federal uh, budgets for science programs, uh, particularly anything focused on conservation, has been shrinking. We conduct workshops with the scientific community, and we work very closely with folks like the sanctuary community, like I've talked about here, or the protected area community or the monument community, to try to identify their priorities for exploration uh, so that we can, so we can appropriately target where we are going to send our vessel to conduct exploration how we target our federal funding opportunity no notices, and how we partner with groups like the Ocean Exploration Trust and the Schmidt Ocean Institute to see if they can support our work and activities as well. We also partner very strongly with other federal agencies. Uh, we leverage a lot of resources where we may provide ship time, or we may provide staffing support or technology capabilities for other agencies like the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management or the U.S. Geological Survey provide funding to support the scientific side of exploration that is both beneficial from a science perspective, beneficial from a NOAA mission perspective, and beneficial from a partner mission perspective. We, we are also looking to expand our partnerships and have active uh, opportunities underway that we're scoping out with the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Navy, and um, NASA, as it turns out, uh, as NASA looks to explore the oceans on other planets. So we do what we can with what we have, but we stretch our dollars by partnering uh, with those who have resources and capabilities and, and with those who have assets that they can bring to the table as well. Okay. Um, Great, thank you, Alan. And I, there was another very important question: is how do I get to go on one of your cruises? <laughs> well, once you once you find the answer to that, tell me because I'd like to find out how to go on one of my cruises. I I say that a little glibly. One of the beautiful things about telepresence is that you can go on one of our cruises anytime we're on the water. You may not be on the ship, but you can be on the cruise at least virtually. Um, we do have limited berthing space, but on on every cruise we've got science science support staff. Uh, we have mapping interns, quite frankly, that we that we have participated in our cruises. So we bring interns from the community and we, we train them up on mapping uh, techniques that, that oftentimes leads to them making career path choices or graduate school choices and things like that. Uh, but we do have very limited berthing space on the, the, on the, the NOAA vessel uh, Okeanos Explorer. So it makes adding extra people tough. However, and I don't want to speak for our, our, our strong partner, the Ocean Exploration Trust, they have more berthing space uh, and may be able to accommodate as well. I'm sure they'd be happy to entertain those. I, I'm, I'm happy to provide connections if people don't already have that. Uh, again, don't want to put OET on the, on the spot, but uh, they've been very open to having people participate as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question, how could new technology help support ocean exploration in the future? It's an excellent question, and, and quite frankly, one, one that we're looking at, but because of the resource constraints, makes it really difficult to attack. This is where some of the partnering with folks like Navy, uh, NASA, and the private sector, and the philanthropic groups um, is really helpful. But one could easily, I think, imagine a situation in the future where you're able to do much of what we do now with remotely operated vehicles and ships and telepresence with autonomous underwater vehicles and autonomous surface vehicles. Uh, there has been some demonstration of this capability already. Um, I don't know that the operational paradigms have really been set in stone, uh, so that's something that we need to explore. But then the other piece of that is a major chunk of this that I think is going to advance dramatically over the next three years is the, the Shell Ocean Discovery X Prize uh, that was launched this past December at AGU. Uh, I'm, on, I'm, I'm a member of their scientific advisory board, but it's really geared towards advancing 
shipless based exploration technology. So I think we're going to see a lot coming in the next few years that's going to open up our eyes about what future operational paradigms might be. I don't think we're looking at a near future that doesn't still involve ships, remotely operated vehicles, sample collection, and, and you know scientists participating on the ships. Um, but we may be looking at a future where these advanced and alternative technologies can expand the footprint of our exploration activities while we're out there or conduct some exploration uh, with, with just minimal scientific involvement in real time. Okay, great. Thank you, Alan. Um, so tell us more about the partnership with Cuba. So this is a good one. So, so as it turns out, um, the, the sanctuaries, of course, have a sister sanctuary set up with Cuba. I, I'm not going to speak to that because I'm, I'm certainly not fully knowledgeable about all of that. Uh, the U.S., of course, has, 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 is currently trying to strengthen uh, diplomatic ties. And so we see this as an opportunity to conduct some exploration in these sanctuaries in Cuba. Uh, part of it, this fall effort, is, is somewhat of a natural extension of the Pulley Ridge efforts. If we believe that that there may be connectivity between protected areas off of the Florida Keys and from Pulley Ridge habitat area particular concern, um, it would be natural based on the prevailing oceanic, uh, oceanic currents to think that there might also be connectivity to sanctuaries in Cuba. So this fall, there's going to be a cruise led by Florida Atlantic University and the University of Miami to start exploring some of that. Uh, if, if it's possible, we're hoping that the Oceanus Explorer can follow that up as it's coming back into the Atlantic in late 2017 or early 2018, uh, and, and I could see a real potential need for focusing on that, that that not only serves scientific purpose and connectivity purposes between U.S.-based protected areas or sanctuaries and, and other nations' uh, protected areas and sanctuaries, but of course clearly also diplomatic ties and scientific ties to other nations as well. So details are still forthcoming. They're still being worked out for the large part, um, but we're excited about this potential opportunity. Okay, great. And then uh, Steve Giddings also had the comment regarding Cuba. We are working with uh, the Gulf Coast Fisheries Institute to include a session at their November meeting on connectivity with Cuba, the U.S., and the Cayman Islands. Fantastic. I, I, I'd love uh, Steve, I'll get a hold of you and learn some more about it. Okay. Um, let's see. And could you talk more about um, OER support for exploring the extended continental shelf? Absolutely. Happy to. So. So uh, many know that the U.S. Um, <clears throat> is taking a look at what needs to be done for, for a claim to extend the continental shelf. Of course, we're not party to the law of the sea, so we, we couldn't make an official claim to that process. But we are going through the work of doing all of the exploration that's needed to make that happen. Uh, one of the very interesting things to me is that exploration in a sanctuary or a protected area or a monument um, that focuses on, on, on visual and bathymetric characterization of these habitats are the exact same technologies that would use you would use looking at potential areas for expansion of continental shelf. You would you would use a ship and a remotely operated vehicle. You would use, do bathymetric mapping, visual inspection, sample collection of, of things like geological samples in particular, uh, and and maybe some uh, biological samples as well to look at whether or not these areas are logically connected just off of, our, of what is our current continental shelf and whether or not we could be making a claim to expend, extend those areas uh, b because they, they could hold commercially viable um, uh, sources for us or they could be important for habitats that we're trying to conserve and manage. Um, so we are the primary office that, that supports NOAA efforts in this arena. Uh, we spend several million dollars a year we work closely with the Office of Coast Survey within NOAA and the U.S. State Department to make sure that they're getting the data and information. We have strong partners in the academic community as well uh, at the University of New Hampshire that are pretty pivotal to this effort. So a lot of the work that we're doing there has been to support the U.S. efforts. Uh, I, would, I would argue that we, you know, to date we're probably about 94 to 95 percent of the way there for those things that need to be mapped. But one of the fascinating things is that almost any time we're out there doing the mapping for uh, the ECS mapping, we're, we're realizing that there are additional areas that we may need to, to map. So there are additional priority areas that were originally set up that we're trying to pick off and get 100% mapped, but what, I don't know that we're ever going to hit that 100% number because every time we're out there, we're like, oh, wait, we need to map this area that's adjacent to this as well, or we need to come back and we need to look at these areas that are around here. So uh, great work that's going on there. Uh, we're happy to support it. 
We've got the cap some of the technical capabilities to make that happen. And of course, we fund people who have the technical capabilities as well. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, and there was a quick question. What vessel will, will be used for the 2016 fall Southeast Atlantic efforts? Uh, that's a great question. I don't have the list off the top of my head. Um, it's, wait, it's the Pisces. Okay, all right. This is a, this is a project that's being led by uh, Arthur Nizinski at, uh, at the National Marine Fisheries Service. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one last thing I was going to ask you about, and that was about um, OER's role in the Marine Biodiversity Network, or MBON. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that is less known about the office, and, 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 and to be honest, truthful, it's not a huge resource part of our office, is that we also support um, what I would consider exploratory science activities. These are, these are activities that could hold promise for many NOAA missions um, and other agency missions, as it turns out, but that might not yet be, uh, I'll use the term mainstream enough for existing NOAA programs to, to really take and, and bite off. So we're involved with IUs and with other agencies and funding this, this multi-year um, MBON effort, uh, three projects going on, one focused in South Florida, one in Southern California, and the other one in the Arctic. So we provide support for that, and we also have some staffing support that helps try to coordinate those activities so that we can learn across the different projects. Um, Shell was, of course, funding that to a great degree as well. Um, but recently pulled back on their funding for that. So it looks like um, OER and IUs and a couple of other offices within NOAA uh, are scrambling around to try to figure out if we can pick up the slack and to make sure that we can continue those activities. The, the other science piece I'd talk about with respect to that that's related is that OER has been pushing jointly with uh, fisheries and with uh, NOAA's um, Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory uh, metagenomics and genomics in general, and how we can better uh, integrate that into scientific data collection that might support uh, decision making as well. Okay, um, that's great. Alan, this was fascinating, and we're so glad you could be on. And um, before we end, I also wanted to recognize Joanne Flanders from your office, who also uh, works with the NOAA MPA Center for helping coordinate both the, the webinars in general and also this particular presentation. Um, so I think we are done, and uh, just wanted to thank everyone for attending, um, and we hope we see you on future webinars. Well, thank you very much, and again, yeah, thank you definitely for for acknowledging Joanne. She has been a stalwart in this partnership between the MPA Center and OER, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't include Katie Wagner, our communications person, who really spent a lot of time uh, making this presentation look beautiful. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, everyone else. All right. And see you soon. Bye, everyone. All right. Thank you.